Hello. It's been a little while since my last video, longer than I would have liked, but I've been quite busy with my rebrand. <laughs> I'm now known as Taylor Faye, not as Taylor Dressmaker anymore. I wanted to have something a little bit more generic, and what's more generic in terms of content than my own name. So yeah, I went with that. Um, I went with a total sort of re-image with it all, totally rebranded like the font that I'm using. And I am now hard at work trying to get my website to match. And then I need to sort out all my sewing patterns and to make sure that they're all the same as well. I didn't, I wasn't a huge fan of Taylor Dressmaker. I wanted something a bit different and I just couldn't think of anything else. And the only other thing that I would have gone with, um, I think was Taylor Made and I couldn't get the domain name for that. So I've just gone with my name. So I've got lots of different videos planned for the future, a couple of different types of series, ongoing series, and this is gonna be the first one and one that I'm super, super ecstatic about. So it's showcasing women in fashion history that you've probably never heard of. I kind of explained in my last video why I wanted to do this because I love hearing about individual stories and especially bringing women to the forefront and you know if they've broken down barriers or um, set examples for people that come after them I just think it's great and obviously because I am sewing related I wanted to make it in that sort of topic so I've picked two or three women initially who I want to make videos for. It's going to be bite-sized history lessons so I've condensed the content that I found out about them into sort of five to ten minute kind of points throughout their life. I know it's you shouldn't really try and condense anyone's life into that amount of time but the way I'm going to do this is that I'm going to take you through the all the steps throughout their lives that I think are the most important to be told and then I'm going to leave all my resources at the end so if you want to do some further reading which I absolutely recommend then you can click through to the resources that I used so if you love fashion sewing fashion history or you just want to learn about some awesome women then please subscribe it helps my channel so much and it means you'll get a notification every time I post one of these videos so you'll be one of the first people to watch so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Elizabeth Keckley. Elizabeth Hobbs was born into enslavement on a plantation in Virginia in 1818. Her parents were Agnes and George Hobbs, although he was not her biological father. That was Colonel Armstead Burwell, the plantation owner, and Elizabeth was sadly most likely the product of a non-consensual encounter with her mother and her enslaver. Even though Elizabeth was not his child, George treated her like a daughter, but she did not know the truth of her birth until later in life. As she grew up, she assisted her mother working as a domestic servant and helped to look after the Burwell children. It was also during childhood that her mother taught her how to sew. As Elizabeth grew older, she became more and more aware of the cruel way enslaved people were treated and were subject to multiple lashings. But by far, the most cruel event to happen was when her father was sent away. Colonel Burwell sent him away to the west to another plantation, her family was ripped apart, devastated by a split decision from her enslaver, and she and her mother missed him dearly. He did keep in touch via letters, but neither of them ever got to see him again. Elizabeth later wrote, The announcement fell upon the little circle in that rude log cabin like a thunderbolt. I can remember the scene as if it were yesterday, how my father cried out against the cruel separation, his last kiss, his wild straining of my mother to his bosom, the solemn prayer to heaven, the tears and sobs, the fearful anguish of broken hearts, the last kiss, the last goodbye, and he, my father, was gone. Gone forever. When Elizabeth turned 14, she was sent to North Carolina to work for Colonel Burwell's son. Elizabeth wrote that she disliked being here greatly and was often whipped for no real reason. It was also here that she was repeatedly raped by a white store owner and became pregnant with her son George, who she named after her father. She wrote sombre words of his coming to be in her biography. If my poor boy ever suffered any humiliating pangs on account of birth, he could not blame his mother, for God knows she did not wish to give him life. He must blame the edicts of that society which deemed it no crime to undermine the virtue of girls in my then position. Elizabeth left North Carolina in 1842 and returned to the plantation in Virginia. By this time the colonel had died and she was sent to live with her former mistress Mary and her daughter and son-in-law Hugh Garland. She was however reunited with her mother at this time. 
In 1846, on the brink of bankruptcy, Hugh Garland moved the family out to St. Louis and tried to loan out Elizabeth's mother. But Elizabeth strongly objected and offered to use her skills as a seamstress to make the family money, and it wasn't long before she was making dresses for high society women in Missouri. She worked as a dressmaker here for 12 years. It was during 1850 that she met a free man named James Keckley and he proposed to Elizabeth. She initially refused because she didn't want to marry whilst still in enslavement, because she knew that it meant any future children she had would also be enslaved. So she decided to pursue her freedom and asked Hugh to allow her to purchase her and her son George's freedom. He eventually agreed on the terms that she could pay $1,200 for this, and it is most likely he only agreed because he assumed Elizabeth would never be able to pay such a high sum of money. Now she had a price on her freedom, she married James Keckley, with Hugh walking her down the aisle. However, this marriage was most likely an unhappy one, as Elizabeth barely mentioned him in her memoir. Elizabeth knew there was no way she could raise the $1,200 alone, as she couldn't accumulate any savings and spent most of her spare time doing household chores for the Garland family. So she decided to stop her sewing business temporarily and travelled to New York to appeal to freedom groups to give her a loan, and in 1855 she finally signed her emancipation papers. After Elizabeth became a free woman, she divorced her husband and raised the money to pay back her loans by getting her dressmaking business back up and running. It was also during this time that her mother Agnes sadly passed away. After paying her debts, she moved to Washington DC in 1860 and made dresses for acquaintances of the First Lady and then was eventually introduced to her. After impressing Mary with her beautiful dresses, she took her measurements and set about making a dress for Mrs Lincoln, and it was the President himself that impressed upon his wife to keep Elizabeth around. After seeing the first dress, he said, you look charming in that dress. Mrs. Keckley has met with great success. Mary then continued to employ Elizabeth, and she sewed around 16 dresses for her, and they also became close friends, with Mary even shortening her name to Elizabeth in fondness. Unfortunately, very few of Elizabeth's dresses are still around today, but I'm going to show you some pictures of the ones that are, so you can appreciate just how talented she was. So this is a beautiful velvet gown. This was made for and worn by Mary Lincoln. Now I can't imagine the amount of time and skill it took Elizabeth to make something like this in a time where hand sewing would have been still, you know, quite prevalent. I'm unsure if she'd have had a sewing machine early on, although you'd hope that after her business took off, she would have been able to buy at least a small one to make things easier for herself. But obviously in the 19th century, it would have been a manual machine anyway. Next up is a short-sleeved pinstripe dress with flower detail. So you can see the pleating on the huge skirt and lace detail on the bodice um, hanging down the sleeves as well. This was an evening dress worn by Mrs Lincoln. Um, and now this is a picture of what the same dress looks like today. It was unfortunately altered after it was sold and turned into some weird like t-shirt style bodice. Personally, I prefer the original style. This gingham outfit isn't a far cry from some of the modern pieces I've seen being made today on Instagram. Again, this was made for the First Lady, and it's crazy to think that this print has been around for so long. The matching cape is magnificent. <laughs> it is crazy how some styles come and go, isn't it? As well as her dressmaking, Elizabeth also founded a relief society to help enslaved refugees and even persuaded Mrs Lincoln to donate to the society. They were so close that when President Lincoln was assassinated, Mary Lincoln asked for her friend to be brought to help with her grief. And later, in 1866, Mary Lincoln reached out to Elizabeth to join her in New York and assist her in selling parts of her wardrobe to ease her huge mounting debts. It was Elizabeth's job to find buyers for Mary's clothes, but the trip did not go to plan. Elizabeth tried to arrange a public auction for the clothes, which was hugely frowned upon by the local press, and Mary's reputation was damaged during the process. Their friendship was also massively strained during this time, and the two women quickly drifted apart after the failed venture. Elizabeth published a memoir in 1868 called Behind the Scenes or Thirty Years a Slave and Four Years in the White House. The book detailed her life but also included details of the dreadful dress-selling saga involving Mary's dresses. By writing about this, Elizabeth was trying to redeem Mary and her own reputation, but it only did further damage to both. The public did not react well to a book that described a close relationship between a white woman of high standing and a former enslaved woman. It challenged the social norms of race, class and gender and critics argued at the time that the book was an example of why black women should not be educated. Elizabeth continued sewing after the book was released but most of her customers disappeared after her reputation was tarnished. So she spent the later years of her life training black women in dressmaking and died in 1907 at the age of 89 after living an extraordinary life. I think it's extremely important that women like Elizabeth are still remembered today. 
Not only was she forced to make huge sacrifices in her life, she also fought against what would have seemed like an impossible battle just to gain her freedom. Can't begin to imagine how many other enslaved people who, just like her, also asked for their freedom but just didn't have the means to achieve it. So it was incredibly brave of her to share the absolute truth of her life and the horrors that she faced just for the colour of her skin and the gender she was born into. I'm sure many people would have warned her against publishing her memoir, but she did it anyway, despite the world she lived in being too ignorant to want to listen. And it took people like her to break down these attitude barriers and ultimately pave the way for social change and allow others to want to keep up the fight for equality. Now, I've attached a document in the description which lists all the references for information and images I used in this video. Please feel free to check that out if you want to learn more about Elizabeth's life.